A long time ago, I read a book. It was a beautiful and complicated book, the story of a man lost in a maze. But that's not quite right. There were also objects lost in the maze, and ideas, and architecture, too. The book itself was a maze. The letters on the page seemed as ambulant as the characters in the story. Sometimes the words release their obedient grip on the margins to gather themselves into cryptic figures. The book was full of ideas, its author's erudition as apparent as his identity was ambiguous. Some say the author was a priest, others think he was a philosopher, others still, marveling at the beautiful buildings depicted throughout, are convinced he was an architect. One careful reader found a man's name cryptically encoded into the text, but that didn't seem to settle the authorship debate for anyone. This was that book, but it could have been this one. 500 years later, I read another book. It was a beautiful and complicated story, the story of a man lost in a maze, but that's not quite right. There were men lost in the maze, and also women and objects and ideas, and architecture too. The book itself was a maze. The letters on the page seemed as ambulant as the characters in the story. Sometimes the words release their obedient grip on the margins to gather themselves into cryptic figures. Sometimes the letters release their obedient grip on the words they signified. The book was full of ideas, its author's erudition is apparent as his identity was ambiguous. Some say the author was a filmmaker, others think he was a philosopher, others still, marveling at the spatial complexities depicted throughout, are convinced he was an architect. One careful reader found a man's name cryptically encoded into the text, but that didn't seem to settle the debate for anyone. This was that book, but it could have been this one. Not long after, I read one more book. It was a beautiful and complicated book, the story of two young lovers traveling across the country. But that's not quite right. It was two stories in near-perfect symmetry, layered into and through one another like the strands of a braid. The book itself was a braid. The letters on the page seemed as ambulant as the characters in the story. Sometimes the words escaped the domineering grip of the narrative to gather themselves into cryptic lists at the margins. Sometimes the letters released their domineering grip on the words they signified. The book was full of ideas. Its author's erudition is apparent as his identity was ambiguous. Some say the author was a young woman. Others think it was a young man. Others still, marveling at the carefully orchestrated symmetries depicted throughout, are convinced he was an architect. Careful readers continue to search for names cryptically encoded into the text, but I don't think that's going to settle the question for anyone. This was that book but it could have been this one. I count myself among those careful readers who scour these texts for coded clues, and I'm convinced that the paradoxical symmetries that echo in the 500-year void between the first pair of books are as meticulously calibrated as those that palpitate in the intimate fissures of the second. But books like these, I suspect, prey on those of us who are prone to see faces in the clouds. Not long from now, I plan to read another book, I expect it to be a beautiful and complicated book, the story of a young girl who finds a kitten. But I'm sure that's not quite right, and I hope tonight's talk doesn't settle that question for me or for anyone. Please help me welcome Mark Danielewski. So let's start with the good news and the bad news. The good news is Now let's get to the bad news. <laughs> uh, tonight is not a lecture. I'm not going to be explaining anything. Uh, it's not a PowerPoint. I'm not going to be illustrating anything. And in fact, it's going to be a bit difficult. It's going to take an hour. It's not 20 minutes or 40 minutes, but it takes a full hour. And that doesn't include these prefatory remarks. Uh, which SciArc, by the way, does have my permission to transcribe if they wish. Um, it's going to be dense, convoluted, a little dangerous. It requires focus, and it requires a lot of imagination, not particularly humorous. Uh, some may want to leave. You have my permission. You may leave. Uh, despite impressions, perhaps, I still write for one. So it is my wish that tonight may resonate 
with someone years from now who's caught in their own vast, complicated project, born under by trivia and toils, who suddenly realize that in this moment, they still have to honor that spirit that led them to this creative profession in the first place. They must still keep that creativity alive, dangerous, not necessarily penned up and ailing, ignored. And you, whoever you are, and I, I don't know who you are, I want to dedicate this evening to you. So as Todd mentioned, I'm in the middle of a new project which started in 2006 called The Familiar about a 12-year-old girl who finds a kitten. And it is uh, 27 volumes long. I have written 10 volumes. And the first volume, uh, which Todd was right, has <laughs> many moving parts, is actually due at my publishers uh, on April 9th. So I am in the very thick of that. And yet, I had to crawl out here. and. Um, I have been thinking about what I would present here, and I, I decided that what I wanted to do was share with you something that I had written on the side. It's not something that's published. Very few people have read it. But it was necessary for me to write in order to move forward on this project that involves all sorts of trivial details and stresses that, that go from what's on the page to you know, color components to contracts, et cetera, that I needed to write this thing. And if people comment later on the familiar and say, oh, look how he did this or look how he did that, that didn't come out of doing this or that. That came out of doing something on the side which looked completely different from the familiar. And so that's that thing that I want to give to you um, or share with you. And I want, I want to share it with, with also an understanding that I feel it's very significant. I don't care if you like it or don't like it, but it's significant enough to me that I can turn to it as a reminder to myself um, about what I do. And so uh, a couple of notes, the you and what's to follow is not the you I'm addressing now. And the first person that's about to follow is not the I that is speaking. If anything, I'm the guy throwing the popcorn. That'll make sense to you a little later. Uh, so one final note is um, I used to have this creative riff where I would, people would ask me about the creative process. And I called it the uh, Jane Goodall with, uh, with chimpanzees. Actually, the first time I said it, I said it's like Jane Goodall and the gorillas. And someone yelled at the back, from the back of the room and said, Jane Goodall didn't work with gorillas. She worked with chimpanzees. Um, so I thank her. That was in Texas. Um, <laughs> so you know, my, what I have always said is that you go into the jungle on a certain day, and you sit down at a certain spot, and you sit there very quietly for a long period of time, and then you leave. And then the next day, you go to the same spot, and you sit there very quietly for the same amount of time, and you listen, and then you leave. And then eventually, in that jungle, you start to hear sounds, and you keep going every day, and you sit at the same spot, and you listen. And after a while, you start to hear these voices out in all the green, and then they come closer, and eventually they meet the chimpan you meet the chimpanzees. And then they begin to tell you their stories. They tell you their worries. They tell you their possibilities. And those are your creative chimpanzees. And if you decide one day not to show up, and, or you show up late, then you may get there, and the chimpanzees are just going to throw shit at you, which is what you're going to produce. Um, or they can get very angry at you. And I still do that. I, I think it's all about routine. It's about sitting down. It's about being there and listening to your chimpanzees. But over the years, I've realized the jungle has a lot more than chimpanzees. And I began to hear other sounds. And some of those sounds can get quite terrifying, especially when you're outside of your comfortable perimeter and you're starting to do something that you've never done before. And you're getting older and you're ailing and you're, you're starting to face things that are 
you know, so, so, <laughs> they're so obvious, you know, in the cycles of life, and yet you're sort of confounded that they are happening to you. And uh, so I began to think about Wittgenstein's, you know, famous quote that if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. And then I began to un think about the tiger. Well, what then of, of the tiger? What if the tiger could make him or herself understood, but chose not to? So it's to this speechless tiger that I am going to devote the next hour. I am your tiger at the zoo. Not that you recognize this. And what say we forget considered it or even briefly suspected it? Distinctions, to be fair, lost on you, and to be fair again, lost on me too. And also to get, in, to get into something right away, what me is is a tangle. Tiger yawns once. Not that I care, yawns twice. Which I realize might be exactly what attracted you here in the first place, the not caring part. I mean beyond the obvious call of these orange stripes, pitch sliced, and my size, of course. And that such size could move at all, let alone move so quickly or so the rumors go, which when you came around was certainly not evident. Just this couldn't care lessing I'm so good at, or this tangly me, or that, what that, or that what I is is a tangly thing too. Not the you, though. Definitely not the you. No tangles there, or couldn't care lessing. In fact, the you will remain our stony truth. I who am me without a me, I who am I without an I, am definitely your tiger at the zoo, but you didn't get that. Tiger flicks tail. And that was your first mistake. You will make three. You presumed I was everyone's tiger at the zoo. Idiot, fool, food. Everyone's tiger at the zoo? Really? Though to be fair, tiger blinks slowly. Along with all this couldn't care lessing, I'm not particularly fair either, just lazy. Really quite superb at it, lolling around, napping and waiting, that too. Still, maybe it was this, this what, poor assumption of yours, a kind of erroneous yet critical conclusion, call it belief. Though belief in what? Some larger impression, a collective entitlement? My apparent resemblance to common property, really? that once you've paid for your tickets, I've heard about tickets, it's when you part with something in return get to claim something. In your case, you get to see something. Is it see? Regardless, cast your eyes down here upon me. Or better, behold, yes, that's it, behold, this heave of fur. What you just declared a rug, your rug, your fat rug. Though curiously, as if instinct already knew better, you did so under your breath. Unfortunately for you, my hearing is very good. Tiger's right ear twitches. And point in fact, I'm not fat, just loose. I pace here a lot at night, whenever I'm alone. Though given the context, which we'll get to in a moment, this place, this enclosure, this zoo, I can't much blame you, even if being a tiger grants me the right to pretty much blame whatever I want, whenever I want. Count it as one of the cardinal privileges of beasts. Second right ear twitch. Nevertheless, maybe this belief in the display of common property before everything and everyone endowed you with a sense of just enough anonymity to misunderstand your namelessness as a permission to ridicule. Some belief, albeit a temporary belief, very temporary. Tiger's jaws ease agape. Unfortunately for you, again, what you saw you did not comprehend. There are no bars here to institute your belief. And I am no panther, infinitely pending in her back and forth gait, even to the point of consuming herself in the sweet sweat of her dark pelt. I am no she, nor him. Just look at me, Tiger raises head. Come on, really look. Squinny those eyes if you have to. Focus on these stripes of tar perhaps like California tar, and citrus, California citrus, and then focus beyond, here all sprawled out, unmoved, head lowering again. Because yawns actually exhaust me. In fact, easing my jaws agape exhausts me too. 
front paws tucked away, back legs splayed out, abraded rear claws withdrawn, all of me impatient to the point of paralysis. Even sparrows hopping nearby can't stir me. They peck at the earth, dart for the clouds, light as shadows, boring. See them go? I won't. None of which, by the way, I, who am without an eye, voice. Because this, despite everyone's wishful thinking, is not my voice. Though my voice you will hear soon enough, don't you worry. A voice you would have preferred to remember, or at least have had the luxury to try to remember. No one really remembers my voice, which, yes, does imply you might have made a different choice. Not that I'm much better at making choices. I ended up here, too, after all. Still, isn't it wild to consider how on such a dull afternoon, though now really much closer to dusk, a moment lived when you might have left wild plans to wild imaginings, popped a few more wasabi peas in that rash if fragile mouth of yours, because no matter how rash or even petulant, every mouth up there is fragile compared with mine. Didn't I just open my jaws slightly? Didn't you see that? Do you have any idea how much my jawbone weighs? Imagine for an instant the muscles needed to support such an act of casual suspension. Maybe if you had, you would have listened to that woman beside you, your wife. I can't hear her, Tiger sniffs. But I can guess her intent. Obviously, she is a kind of monkey girl prefers all those prehensile tails and small opposable thumbs, shrieks and nut-grubbing clicks, to where you should have made your merry way instead of, well, exchanging with your wife, I'm pretty sure it's your wife, her bag of popcorn for your wasabi peas, which she uses then to swallow her intentions. After all, the primate center is maybe a little too far away. One of those disdainful green rounds prudently placed in her mouth, such terribly fragile mouths you all have, no muscles at all needed to help keepers closed or open while you get on with the show. And oh, what a show. To be fair again, you're not alone in finding me so unbelievable here at the bottom of this concrete bowl, this place composed of uric displeasure and amputation. That's right, amputation. Please don't protest. Yes, I know. I know. You count four limbs. And yes, also intact, one long and very proud tail with habits of its own. And though you probably can't see this far to count conclusively, not a whisker is missing, not even a tooth. So what gives? This. You do not understand amputation because you have not known imprisonment. And crutches and wheelchairs are just the beginning. Grippers and hooks, too. Don't forget those knee blades. Did you realize ex-cons behave differently here, around me, especially those who have served time, real time? They confide. It's true. Even I am a confessor at times. You, one recently released, once whispered, aren't no tiger. You the feeling of what it means to die inside, still alive. The feeling that never dies, even if you make it alive outside. Like these unfortunates, these striving deprived, as I consider them, you also find in me something unbelievable. Though unlike you, these partials, as I also consider them, detect a shared instinct, or rather the lack thereof. What no salatium can amend, what not even time can give back. Amputation not only speaks of paws and ears, tail and whatever fleshy appendage one cares to isolate, that which will not return. Amputation also speaks of cutting away the self from the self, or better, selves from the self. Whiskers, then, are a bad example. My bad. They do grow back. Mine have, many times, never a one missing, at least not for long. Here's a better example. The cutting away from these legs, those legs once accustomed to traversing tree lines drooped with powder and night ice. Not even snow at noon, and up to my chest, too, a soft, clumping churn could slow me from the hundreds of miles I easily roamed, typically roamed. But those great legs capable of such distances are gone, long gone. For example, I have many. For example, crossing into a frontier of appetite, 
maddening beyond sense, even memory, and yet still incapable of halting me, and so in turn discovering on my behalf still more selves, maybe lost, certainly undiscovered, in hiding, asleep, but never amputated, merely hibernating until called forth by one appalling autumn of necessity, selves suited for a far greater torments and pursuits rising up, called into service by that grotesque order of need, bone-thinning hunger, just as helpless as it is absolute, even as I go on to miss still another seek a deer and later again a brown hare, a bony, a fleet thing, hind hardly worth the crunch and gulp, with hardly sustenance enough to grant an extra moment, let alone a day, and even so escaping what I would give for even just that tiny pelvic crunch and gulp, or for even a litter of newborn sables, but I give nothing, leaving me momentless and huffing, delirious before this chewing depletion, which by ragged, invisible teeth never ceases to diminish my guts, my form. And I am so thirsty, too. Until hours later, or maybe days later, still caught in the same fugue of constantly exceeded ends, I snatch upon the air the end to such ends, a teeth-wetting whisper of something more. Bore, there. Beyond very bright thickets, plump little fruits, many scattered, rotting, fallen things I can't stand, settling deep between oily roots, beside black, oily scat, boar, and so close to, upwind, unmoving, unaware. That is until, as all winds eventually do, must do, this wind spins lazily around, carrying me back to one teeth-wetting whisper, all that this better piss now, better shit now whisper can demand, my whisper, if a whisper can go unvoiced, by scent alone, commanding what is in any case already too late, too late to shit at any rate, maybe even piss and forget about moving much, which is already moving, would never stop moving, not once, and by now anyway is flying. Of course I can fly. I clear boughs, I top trees, I blow every bough and tree down, a whole forest gone, and with this descent mine upon such rough hide from Verbrysa to Sigmoid hide, hardly time to even flinch, Forget grunt or squeal, maybe a kick, mostly trembling. How else to greet this burst of absolute hunger? Without even rage, just one spine-crushing blow. After which the trembling cannot abate, along with some snuffling and, okay, maybe some squeals and some shitting by then, who cares? It's all aftermath, invisible to me, as finally in silence thick spouts of boar blood quench my thirst. But no thirst like that can exist here. No hunger either. Not with this bucket always filling, or that moat, if I had to drink from it. I never have to. Or this meat slide here, clocking my afternoons by slabs of bone and beef, boy, void of breath, let alone pulse, unless it's fasting Monday. Then the meat slide stays dry, and I pace, and I complain as if complaint could cast into doubt that which complains, as if one measly day without appetite's answer could call into question a self, as if so slight a deprivation could prove powerful enough to summon forth those grizzled selves, determined and ancient, hundreds of thousands of years ancient, hundreds of thousands of years strong, never vanquished, never ancient. Nosed itch, not even maimed, Tiger rubs back of right paw. Except down here, Tiger rubs nose again. Down here where a self or what's left of one can only fuss. Another example, that self which only fear can summon, real intense and possessing fear, which is not exercised by anything less than the mightiest answer to fear me, of course, who nonetheless still ran once, terrified by a thing in the sky, no saber-beaked crow either, or some bluebill vulture battering the air, but something larger, harder, slapping down chops of wet air, along with man cries and those metallic cracks I've heard before and learned to heed enough to flee, until I am bounding, outstretched, I can stretch no more. Tiger stretches left paw slightly. Across wild fields dangled with opium poppy, tall spring grasses stiff and waving, soon snapped or low slumped and dew soaked, now trampled until I pound ahead towards what only black storks and bats or that sky thing above would dare cross. I dare cross. I don't even hesitate, a terrifying edge which I lunge over fearless in fear, this leap alone proves it, along with my 
faith proving all of the beyond, which turns out to be not so vertical to demand a fall and end, a not so vertical continuation I keep charging, faster than any fall where at least for a little while my paws keep up with the steep as I descend towards firs and the halo of cherry trees below, this heart the size of four fists, the size of a boar, answering the softer thump, thump, wump above, which is only getting softer now until I can no longer keep up with myself. Paws finally betraying me forward, more than paws can expect to carry. Tiger retracts left paw as I go tumbling over and over and over and only stopping, finally sideways, sideways and twisted, askew in shallows of an ice flake, flake brook from which despite the wild splash I rise and quickly too, shrugging myself loose of water in fear, though some of the high grass above still clings to my coat and those thick muscled walls in my chest for a moment longer continue to pump just as hard, even harder, though not that sky thing beating still its wump, thump, thump if now more distantly against its sun, too afraid to descend here where no fear will ever prohibit me, already disappearing beneath lilacs and broad ferns, Chesenia's lotus and cork trees, until shadows bind shadows, and beyond dark vines and sap-rhymed bark, the jungle takes me back. Sure, all long enough ago to seem not even a memory, or maybe a memory or a badly remembered dream, I have those, of which plenty of spectators from Europe above on high there might have caught sight of me, sprawled here on cement and stained too by all that cement will not absorb, lid sealed but twitching, paws twitching too, as bees seize my throat. You hear that? Tiger's low growl. While I am sometimes delivered beyond the jungle to the beach I once roamed, one dim star cloaked in coastal fog, driving prey into the surging foam, then diving in to take back what not even a sea dares own, until roused and suddenly too by these thoughts of who I no longer am, without sea, without sand, that former self, not even former, without even a fallen cloud to settle in and burn, I awaken here to this confusion of where I am, where I was, where I always am. Not you, though. You have no idea where you are. You just keep turning around and waving your arms proudly, yapping something at that wife of yours, yapping something at someone else, too. Someone I can't see, too little to see. Perhaps trying to peek through the box greenery or more visitors. While you throw back your head, laughing and coughing and finally spitting on the ground, spitting over your shoulder, spitting this way, spitting that way. What you drink then, you finish. Your wife takes it from you. I hear the can clatter on rock, flagstones, I presume. Your wife takes a picture. All of which are antics I've long since grown used to, and none of which will in the slightest ever preempt in me the proliferation of lengthy lists of those examples reflecting just how many selves have been lopped off in the name of this place. Too high to count, truly. Someone once said tigers can't count higher than two. So then, as far as examples go, at the very least, more than two. That goes for selves as well. For instance, how about selves of nuance? These teeth, for example, more sensitive than any penis, nearly claw length, finding their way with an acuity rivaling sight, plunging through bristles and skin, where muscle means nothing, arteries even less, untying sinew, dividing ligaments, while still avoiding bone, navigating those edges of resistance vertebrae to such gaps the spine protects with jelly soft discs of tougher cartilage, giving way quicker than the rest as I take down a reindeer, a wolf, or even a bear. And thanks to the zoo, I can dream now of elephants and zebras and kunkune pigs and mandrels too and yellow back dukers. They're all here, along with the long necks of giraffes for me at last, all for me, one at a time, slicing through each of their respective cords, which until such a moment had kept our hunt in play. And I haven't even touched on selves of desire, drifting over ridges, down valleys, clinging to the air, or just seeping through granite shelves along slides of rotting mulch and mold, between stands of leaning trees, what not even burning creosote or December ice can keep hidden, the scent I never cease finding, never cease giving, smelling her for weeks as she smells me, 
coming for her finally, and finally having her in a copse of moss and spruce needles, troops of mushrooms at our paws, her claws greeting me first, followed by her sensitive teeth, denying me at first and later insisting over and over, beyond all limits of emptiness too, again and again, calling to life a self replete in pleasure and possibility. Tiger shakes head. Something else then of consequence, emergent, following later, found, something found out, some things found around, Tiger grunts once, some things too soon lost, caught, chopped, one more than one, more than thing, more than eats, streaks of sloppy, wow, tumbling, stumbling around, yuling, wows, pleasure of a different sort, Tiger shakes head twice, what no ambush ambushed can un unroute. Tiger grunts twice, caught, chopped, every one gone, leaving behind not even one mewling yowl. Tiger's first soft snarl, or bees to swallow, no bees to swallow. Tiger swallows anyhow. Selves after selves, so many selves hacked in this place. Tiger's second soft snarl. This prison of concrete, this moat encircled dunghill, splattered casually with pigeon shit and sparrow shit, with one meat side and back a sinkhole pocket in what? A pedestrian mall, some place of passing for strolling, with somewhere up there paths and paths, maybe more concrete or flagstones, maybe more trails I just can't see, quaint railings, hand-painted brown, and behind them pale flowers in bloom, whispering among themselves of this storm overhead continues to sweep in, and they reach for it too, if flowers can reach, everything reaches. Or maybe flowers just strive, those ashen petals, geraniums, hand plant planted perhaps, perhaps in some kind of planter box, but of course they're hand planted. For years I've watched the very hands that seed the invisible soil, now and then catching a subtle drift descending here as the wind shimmies and shifts as winds will always do, must do, remember the boar, spinning lazily around, offering another teeth-wetting promise, an agonizing promise, not of petals or of seed or even of soil, just hands, just meat. The smell of meat is always a promise. So many promises live beyond the rail and bloom up there, but I am forbidden to keep them, forbidden twice, first by an appalling circle of water, and second by the sheer wall beyond. Not that I have dared their vertical denial, let alone approach the moat. As you already know, I am now at best a lazy animal, at worst, dull. Despite the unaccounted for cost of my diminishing, do you know I have yet to show the requisite interest in a wooden barrel, let alone those orange cones? True, I once seized a clue of twine, tangly, a mess, sliced it to shreds, ate it, shat it out for weeks. I could care less now about these plastic buckets or the giant wiffle balls. Forget the plank still hanging from that cement tree, the living tree I tore down years ago. You know, I know, I just lie around most of the time, so close to the meat slide I don't even have to get up. I just drag myself along with both front paws, sometimes just one paw, which I've noticed often gets squeals from the little ones from your up above on high up there. Of course, as it turns out, what's nothing new is both your challenge and your confidence. Challenge because you mean to disrupt routine. Confidence because you haven't considered much the meaning of blasphemy. Am I wrong? Tiger twitches tail. Yes, it's so obvious, but you have no clue. Watch how you look on it, on it but, but don't look on it. Well, look on it now. Tail twitch again, as if a tail could get the distraction of a new thought. Tiger's nostrils flare, as if one nostril, make that two, even these two nostrils, both nostrils flare. Could be an ostive widenings, gain the attention of how it is that a thought arranges itself before it is new, let alone thought. Behold blasphemy all around, the mockery of hundreds and hundreds of selves I once knew measured out against the thousands and thousands of miles I once was. It would take a frantic tiger to mete out every, even one mile down here. Forget snow or drought or 
finding oneself in the midst of muddy floods, carrying away mountainsides of timber, carrying everything away except me, frantic indeed, or cunning. And cruelest of all, the evidence, regrettably and without consent, my gorgeous fur, these ropes of dawn, these stripes of dust, conceal all such butchery, just as they conceal, and complicitly too, the excinding edges of this here zoo. Invisible for the most part though, though not always, slicing away from me those selves I keep going on and on about. I guess I'm in mourning still, and while I don't yawn, your wife does, watch her, a big one, too. Selves born to endure, survive, withstand. Oh, there she goes again, a second time. Good, good. Upon boredom, the greatest survivors wait, outwait. At least tigers do. Exemplars of patience, statutes against waste, relishing the taste of stillness and decay, just like they relish the taste of fear, just like they relish the taste of a kill and the satisfaction enjoyed once all are devoured, leaving here finally before you the product of blasphemy. Behold and pay close attention to the greatest of lives, this smallest of selves, me without me's, I without eyes, loose, satiate, securely faithless before any demand for action, what makes boredom boredom, without which makes a boredom bad breath. For I am cut off from exhaustion, and so I sleep. For I am cut off from eating, and so I am fed. For I am cut off from engagement, and so I am observed. Hey, the most common of failed exhortations intent on stirring me from my limbo. Gratefully, you didn't do that. From your up above on high up there, when you first came by pushing ash petals aside, grabbing hold of those brown painted rails, no Favonian breeze favored me with even a faint promise. I had only the setting sun behind me, a sliver between storm and rising night, bringing nothing down to me, to taste that is, except the day's dying and sterile light, which nonetheless still did grant me something that needs no promise, a rose-warm glow catching, well, catching you, by a spear of peculiar purpose, setting alight your edges, framing you, just you, smug, feckless, with not even the faintest shimmer of fear. True, you were different from the rest. That long blur of daily traffic I have come to accept. Haze mostly, tiger stretches right paw. Some highs, curses too. Right paw, claw stretches. Now and then a solitary puff of corn floating down to settle on the moat surface. Until no fish here, water eats it or does what water does and bears it down. My everyone up there never threatens my limbo with something rattling, rousing, forget unique. Not that you were unique or especially rousing or rattling. As far as I was concerned, you were just another dumb aspect of the same everyone, even if the crouching sun made you burn a bit, bit brighter. But so what, right? Whether bright or not, everything burns one way or another. You displayed nothing exceptional. Until that is. You made it snow. Not one or two puffs either. You dumped the whole bag, feeding the water, though not before provoking in me, invoking too from me, of me far beyond, once a long, long time ago. Barely a memory either, more like a fairy tale, that prattle I've occasionally heard from parents telling their bawling brood about Lujin or Sothenai or Detroit, or just me as if despite lying right here, almost within reach, I were also at the same time something beyond the needs of conviction fabled and unreal, as unreal in any case as the fable you let loose from that greasy bag, let drift my way. Something seasonal, wintry, almost cold, almost. Something which even down here in this place of blasphemy and hard stone, despite smells of peanut oil and burnt corn, was implausibly fresh and even familiar. And suddenly no more everyone. Suddenly no more blur. Everything vanished before the sight of you. Even this carceral dump, yes, blasphemy itself, vanished. Welcome. And Merry Christmas, too.
at least for a little while longer, the day nearly sunk, this California dusk heading towards tomorrow, yet here in spite of warmth, both Pacific and dry, also a Siberian winter, this gift, your gift. And that's not all. Because then you did something really outrageous. And what's more, you kept on doing it. You came prepared, see. You came with a plan, and you execute, executed it, too, perfectly. And maybe part of me, who is not me, who is now becoming me again, incredibly, the eyes forever I, must thank you for this reunion of sorts, this miracle of selves, this resurrection. Because thanks to you, my cut off and abandoned selves, fly balloons, strewn, particularized by maggots, devoured by Earth herself, were roused suddenly like ghosts. I never believed in ghosts, and yet here, by example of their return, how wrong I was, these examples of their ire, how very wrong. Angry ghosts, too. Oh, poor you. And set as well on becoming more than ghosts. Poor you again. Clawing up from the ground I've stalked worldwide. Beating back through air I've rent world over. A judgment day of wholeness, my wholeness, impossible. And yet despite protest, rejoining into this unanimous response. And not called forth by some cave guarding stone either. I've heard that fable as well. From your up above on high up there. Yes, my everyone also comes here to preach going on about this rolled away rock I care nothing for, what followed three days hence, what I care even less for, what this three days hence, and what is anything that comes afterwards, especially in winter, where I will live now forever in spite of April. Some have even come to pray, their hair shorn, robes dusty, kneeling in supplication. To well, me, of course, who else and why not? But you did not come to pray, to kneel, or even to tell stories, and you rolled away no rock either. Instead, you threw one, and not just one, a lot of ones, spars of flint sharper than gravel, rough as broken brick, and you didn't stop. Two second intervals, one more at any rate. You'd, you, you didn't even have time to applaud yourself. Your wife, though, did have time, and I suspect it would have pleased you, made you throw harder, but applause was somehow not an option for her. Surprise does that. I don't even know where you got the rocks, pockets full. And that was your second mistake. Maybe you thought I lost track, stopped counting. After all, and maybe all is two. Whoever claimed tigers can't count higher than two also said it was because we lost interest so quickly. So maybe you're in luck. The stones you throw are also symbols, of course. But I couldn't care less about symbols. Even when I sense them, they make no sense. Their hardness, though, I hear by flesh. Their sharpness speaks a tongue speech need learn nothing from. And their heaviness comes nowhere close to all I charge against the world. And so in this dusk, night leading hard now on dusk, the storm leaning in too, harder if rainless yet and still mute, clouds though like homeless bees coagulating it all, I am by your sharp and hard faults turned, tiger shifts. Twisted, tiger twists. Even lifted, tiger starts gathering. Up from my sprawl, tiger initiates, initiates rise. From splayed legs to tucked paws, tiger still rising. Up from the slumbering stretch, tiger still rising. To all fours, tiger's last yawn. Not so terribly high when you get right down to it, tiger's end of gathering. What with all these underneath, long waves of white hair from belly to chest hanging down, the fat on these ribs joining the hairy flow too, I'm hardly tall. Behind railing and wall you now lean against, half hidden by, I, I would disappear completely. And yet by those globes hung nearby on high posts, starting to buzz with light, which you can't come close to reaching, I already succeed, exceed. Already I am taller than storm. Anyway, that is no storm above, taller than night, taller even than the first dangerous stars. But there are no stars tonight, even if you still know the ones living on behind the throb of getting on with it, driving us, warping us, those deadly shatterings of influence which have known us all along, which move us all along, 
how it is in the end I weigh so much, weigh still more, tons and tons of me, outweighing you, me, means this place, any place. There is no blasphemy I don't outweigh, but when I move, I move like nothing. See the sparrows dart, surprised enough by this rising not to return. I won't miss them, no one will. None of which, by the way, I actually voice, but at least this, to your dissatisfaction, you already know. Though rest assured, my voice you will hear soon enough. Tellingly, in the face of such movement, or maybe it's too small, inconsequential, your confidence doesn't waver in the slightest. So much for instinct. Quite the contrary, those stones of yours, you keep them coming. Slap, slap, pap. Compressed little insistences. Tap, tap, bap. Tiny little instances. Whap. At first poorly directed, kicking up loose dirt into my eyes, stinging my nose, these two flaring nostrils before zeroing in, and then pretty successfully, too, until every flinty chip bites at my flanks, my hips, a direct hit to my head, your black petrified popcorn, the real storm, the only storm, a storm of incalculable risk, pelting my joints, my ribs, summoning with each hit this most incalculable occurrence to just get up. And really, surprise, Look at this, I, I really am up. I didn't know I had it in me. Tiger's first step. Fair enough, you have a thick arm, and once you get that thick arm going, even your aim is pretty good. Not that I care about your aim, of course. I don't even care about your stones or your insult, which for some reason you have chosen to add now with each chuck about the quality of my intelligence, my heredity and legacy, my sluggish disposition towards anything other than the meat slide. But you have not seen me here at night. Whack, whack, crack, as if I'm hard to miss. Tiger takes second step. Still, why do I suspect you never thought to count me out for yourself? rely on some rudimentary geometry, toe to heel, for example, to count me out for yourself. Get some idea, idea, toe to heel, toe to heel, some cognizable sense, toe to heel, 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 of what you're really up against, my terrible length. Now, I do take more than a couple of steps. Yes, to be fair, I've already taken quite a few, though it's not the hits, but the thickness of your arm that quickens me, and of course the thickness of your waist. As I've already indicated, I can't see your legs behind the brick in those flowers, whatever they are, but your waist and arm tell me the rest of you. Thick all over. Enough for what eats wanting eats, meats upon meat, plus something runny in the heart of your bones to appease these itchy teeth. And now behold, the simplest turn by me towards you. Did you even see what just happened? How quickly everything just changed? Why your rocks just that easily began smacking the dunghill? A tiger turning will do that, especially one turning to you. Now not so wide, not so fat, and I'm not even hurrying, just yet, yeah, just focusing. And the result of this kind of directness, this kind of purpose, this kind of focus, is a narrowing some have sworn bests in visibility. Let's leave it at a near vanishing. Your wife sees it. No wasabi peas for her. Fragile mouth just hanging low, left there, open as if to say, whoa, where did he just go? More like something skeletal now, right? And tight as this fur-bright, loose-skinned target you so easily smacked moments ago, this wide side of inflamed moonlight and night, got up and just by facing you nearly disappeared behind the fixity of one gaze on one thing alone. Your gaze. What did I find there? easy, what no prey should expose, but what prey, because they are prey, can't fail to expose. You should have looked away. Leaving would have been best, though I gathered it at once that you wouldn't disengage or look away because you didn't know just how vulnerable this made you. What was born into me years gone by, impossible to gouge out, might as well amputate my head 
what recognizes by a glance what will fail to react for one instant too long. It's an extraordinary faculty, really, this faculty I have to endure. Your faculty to endure, however, some might call no faculty at all. Impudence, maybe, or stupidity, or gross failure at best. At worst, other things, mean things, derogatory, spiteful. I know it only as meat or defeat. And even as I stroll from the meat slide past the concrete tree with exposed rebar and the dangling plank, down the dunghill over pigeon shit and sparrow shit towards that appalling moat, your antics do not ease up one iota. You just throw more rocks, harder to. You have your pride. You even begin to cheer and laugh and finally shout to everyone but me. Didn't I promise you a real show, didn't I? And then you lift up your daughter. Ah, she throws out beyond your dull stare. To her credit, she doesn't try hey or hi, or, or is she too young to make such sounds? She is a tiny, tiny little thing. Though it's not so simple as just ah, uh, either. Apparently, she inherited something you didn't, no doubt from your prudent wife. For you see, even though your daughter is so young, not even a mouthful, not even half a mouthful, such a tiny, tiny little thing, she still knows how to react. And fast, too, already squirming in your thick, proud arms, crying now, wailing, really. I can't stand that sound. Not that I can blame her, wailing, no doubt, about the trap she can't explain, the trap you made for her, of her, as you will find out soon enough. At least then, with perhaps the dullest of dull eyes while still declaiming your faith in the certitude of zoos, cages you can count, amputations you can count on, traffic is predictable as the passage of any day, the routine of this place from janitors to officials in sunny little dresses, vendors who accommodate you with bags of butter and spice, Maybe at this sound of alarm from your little kid whose convinced eyes of yours do shift, those convinced eyes of yours do shift an itsy bitsy bit. I catch a different glimmer there, a kind of dark light from all this dark light draping around us now, enfolding us, those globes on high, buzzing brighter, with a sliver of moon up there too, slipping somehow in and out of these clouds, threatening another kind of light, your light of awareness born into you long ago, which still brings hairs erect on the back of your neck, probably all over your body. Hairs that would run if they could. Maybe they do try to uproot, as I now leisurely, and let me emphasize that again, and elongate it too, offering up as an amble, a slouch, even a disinterested shrug, as I leisurely slip into the water and begin to swim across the moat. Did you really think tigers couldn't swim? Disbelief is a dangerous consort and thankfully keeps you company as I reach the far wall. I barely had to paddle, tiger paw churn once. Mostly just pushed off, kept my head afloat, paw churn twice. Now merely eyes, some whiskers and two purses of the whitest fur you'll ever see, my ears. Suddenly I am small, too, a small, swimming, hearing thing, a smelling thing, too, which is too bad, especially at this particular moment, double kick once, with this water foul and greasy and slathered with sinking popcorn and mosquito larva, double kick twice, no more snow and add retching things, too, first retch. I retch a couple of times, second retch. A few, see, I'm already losing count, as droplets of this brack inflict their no noisome penance within my sinuses, annoying, retch, retch, retch. I might even appear in trouble, even defeated. A small, swimming, hearing, smelling, retching thing not much bigger than your child, leaving the tiniest ripples behind. You stop throwing stones, then. You even stop declaiming your success as measured out against the price of admission. Regrettably, the alternative is hardly wiser. I got that thing, that fat thing, to finally move. Me, you shout. 
I even got it to drown. Look, he's drowning. I got him to drown. Oh, man. Cool, cool, cool. When really at this point, you should have gone for help, cried for someone. Run, seriously, right now at this very minimum. You should stop looking. But maybe this is what you wanted most, this kind of focus, which you sure have now. Boy, do you ever. My all on you look, and yes, it does seem to calm you, though you are never without distraction. There's that tiny, tiny daughter of yours, your wife, that thing you constantly take out of your pocket. You don't even notice how all the birds overhead bring on their racket. Those fuckers are already always starting something. One big Tantera panic. And then your wife's favorites, the little monkeys, hear it and go apeshit. And they're not exactly adjacent. But you don't catch it. Not even the cali thump of worry by the hippos. And they're even farther away. Or the llamas. Are those zebras? I remember the first time I saw a zebra. What a wonder to one day kill one of those, roll in such awful. But, but you miss it all. You are distraction's slave. Worse, you are enslaved by the wrong kind of a distraction. Not me. Haven't you noticed? Distraction is my slave. I never take my eyes off you. Even when I reach the opposite wall, sheer dank overarching. You probably took comfort in this vertical distance. What, twice my size? Three times my size? Of course you did. Have you never observed a feral cat clear a high fence in one noiseless bound? Once a visitor standing about where you are now declared scared, very scared, I sense these things, that her apartment cat could easily leap to the top of her refrigerator in one noiseless bound. You're silly, her friend had replied. Tigers can't swim. Though at this moment, maybe just maybe this swimming tiger isn't really a tiger just a head, like I said, and now a pretty stationary head, another amputation of sorts, if one can amputate a body and leave just a head, floating here near your reflection, finally drifting over your reflection, seizing your stare then with endless glare in which you make your choice to see me as you see yourself within the ambit of so many limits and protections. And then I too make a choice. Let's not forget that. I, too, here have an opportunity to do something else. Maybe even be something else, like be just a head, for instance, a head in a reflection, caught in an endless pause. But as I already intimated, I'm not so good when it comes to choices either. After all, I, too, ended up here. I scramble and paw. Tiger's claws rasp wall. You cackinate and call out again and personally start dropping stones again, though by now you're running low and most missing me, splashing the moat, bouncing off the wall, splashing the moat some more. My four paws stop scratching then and sink, but my head does not sink or retreat. See, something is happening underneath which you cannot see. Somewhere below, the thinnest edge hung there invisible to you, to me, the sparrows, barely the width of one of your fingernails, less and just a cruel length beneath the surface, too. Someone put it there by mistake years and years ago, before I came, before I was born, as certain and as preeminent as all our dangerous starts, or even these more dangerous continuations, the slightest extrusion of cement or brick. It makes no difference to me. It's there. It's all I need. It's all I'll ever need. Here is one way faith answers the willing, immovable, irrefutable, a testament to all that is yet to come to pass, supported by what is blind both to the present it announces and the future it authors. Every tomorrow of every world could rest upon this line, and it would not give. And guess what? It does not give. Tiger's rear claws notch, rear claws lock. It settles the rest of me, hind legs crouching then into a still deeper invisibility, out of which will be born my reach. For I am reaches upon reaches. Forget striving. I will outreach you, me, even this place. And what is the sound of a splash when nothing comes down? Because when I leap, 
and I'm leaping now. Hear that sound? I fly. It's far more than a splash, and I'm flying now up that wall, twice my size, three times my size, a fridge, a fence, what does it matter? Higher than even this wall, any wall, certainly higher than those hand-painted rails, those hand-planted flowers, sky, storm, every blinding star. Okay, maybe not that high. Maybe there was some frantic something or other at the top for a moment when I tried to lay claim to the apex that mattered, a wild sickling of claws, tiger swiped a bunch, these hooks swipes a bunch more, scrambling for anything, brick, soil, post to seize hold of, dig, to keep me from falling back, hook, and I could have fallen back, hook again, and nothing would have changed, haul, and everything, heave, would have been different. But I didn't fall back, and then everything was different and nothing changed. Tiger snorts. What a nice surprise. I didn't realize you brought the whole family. Tiger snorts twice. As I suspected, all over, thick, meat upon meats, and no doubt with plenty of runny in the heart of your bones how my teeth tickle. Tiger scratches brick. But let them tickle. Tiger scratches brick twice. There is more here than tickling and itching, let alone scratching, let alone tasting, let alone gulping, let alone me, let alone you. Did you know that one of my claws is half the width of your daughter, half the length of one of your son's shins, the thick of your other son's thigh, longer than your wife's thin neck? Well, you do now. That's one thing all that trouble at the apex accomplished as I hauled myself over the rails to the limit of that wall, to pause, perch really, atop that narrow little garden. It gave you a good look at these nails and these teeth. Is this what you wanted to prove? Which some will wonder. I won't, I don't. Maybe how out of everyone, you alone deserved something different. Which others will wonder, I don't and won't. Maybe you thought I was a lap monkey, like a lap cat, and would stay put no matter what you did. I did not. Is that what you thought? That I was a monkey? That I was a cat? Still, you did get my attention. There's no denying that. Proof, too, for here I am. How you alone, with just a scattering of throws, could upset a division between cages and selves, long regarded with little suspicion. And I guess no suspicion on my part, as you likely gathered. My convictions about amputations forbade me to the added torture of suspecting such an obscene possibility as this escape. After all, obscenity means easy. Congratulations, then. In some ways, you're a saint, my saint. How about that? And yet when the time came, and that time has come, that time is now. You could still stand by privately, confidently, without the torture of suspicion concerning these divisions between selves and cages, about which the zoo has assured everyone, repeatedly, and which you took for granted so credulously. And let's see how much of a saint you really are. For let's not forget it was your heroic and grand show that so successfully made a fable out of what you couldn't help but remain convinced by, so audacious and strong and brave. How I enjoy killing your convictions and your fables, too. And I do it with a truth as light as sparrows, landing on this brick where sparrows won't land, so poorly mortared, ill-prepared for just such an arrival as mine. The new up and above on high up here, stone shift, earth too, a squalor of flowers, geraniums, just as I assumed. They do not tremble, but why should they? I couldn't care less for what doesn't tremble. Nothing I want doesn't tremble. None of which, obviously, I need to voice or even hint at with anything remotely like a sound which includes even the sound of my breath suppressed now. So quiet, so very, very quiet, like raging winds thrown high beyond blackened tours and sun blue crags, which for some reason I'm recalling at this exact moment, nearly at the expense of everything else, at the expense of you. But you tear those moments down. You tear those mountains down. 
and just look at you, down low, down below, down there, all of you, trembling. And perhaps this is a good opportunity, as good as any, because you have the chance, I mean, you're so close, tiger lifts right paw, to consider closely these claws one last time, spreads claws. You're ready, spreads claws even more. Behold the teeth, too, jaws widen even more. Count my whiskers, that is, if you can see anything past these eyes, like my tail whipping back and forth, the only real indication of just how much anger crouches before you, not even one hop away. And rear paws churn up pedal, pistol, and root, then unsettling first the dirt, second the brick and cement, as I noted, poor mason work, chunks of it bursting free, splashing far beneath me, what seems the height of all my years, too many years to ever know, let alone count the sinking also too distant, already over, water eats it, bears it down, as I, tiger jumps, propel myself free once and for all, of this garden, this myth, once upon a time establishing the safety of your reason. Now, your reason is unsafe. Especially with these reaches upon reaches of me, tons and tons of me, which I hurl so easily beyond the limits of your reason, which has only now just started to try to catch up, scrambling frantically, too, as if any of that could help you, trying in vain to correct your first mistake and see me for what I am, your tiger at the zoo. No more jeers now. And from me, for a moment, I confess, I'm a bit stunned. I might have even cocked my head, Tiger Lovell's head. Because if hunger played a part in bringing me here, why am I so suddenly void of any instinct to ingurgitate muscles and joints? Or if fear had its say, where are the helicopters and automatics gashing the air and desire? Well, I certainly don't want to fuck you. I just want what I know, even if knowing what I want is always a clotted, burning thing, especially now. Though since when has knowing made a difference, all that matters is how very, very close I am to you, which maybe is my dazedness wanes. I marvel at, for a moment, like one born anew, as tiger shakes, I shake the last remnants of the zoo from my coat. You actually thought to turn then, or heave back on your heels, full wheeling both arms, going at quite a rate, too, to keep your balance, twisted you around, help you leave? Could you really not see how you were already trapped, cornered, cut off from the only feasible exit? Those other exits surrounding us are illusions. They're irrelevant to one who moves as fast as I can. Your reactions, in fact, are are lost on me. They're so bizarre. I'm briefly confused, I admit it, by such antic and sparking this way and that way, those jabbing elbows and knees, like, like maybe you anticipate something I don't, as if I might have missed something, that despite all I consider, I'm still about to discover something new, like perhaps you can fly. Even tigers now and then have a taste for the absurd, like Maybe you're a bird, instead of this boil of fear, too stunned to shout, let alone manage more than a few stumbling step backwards. And this is your third and final mistake. And no, it's not turning your back on me, though that's true what they say. Never turn your back on a tiger. Apparently you don't know that, that they are they. You just assumed, and proudly too, that you were the first but I was never your tiger first. You were never that lucky, not even your tiger second, or your tiger third, or your tiger fourth. And yes, tigers can't swim, and yes, tigers can't fly, and yes, tigers can't count higher than two. They lose interest so quickly. But here I am, your tiger past five, past all of it, here I am, your tiger, last. Now, I do concede how putting together anything sensible in the face of a tiger, given your present context, not to mention personal obligations, is nearly impossible, especially when in the presence of one such as me, raising pasts, forget the present, the present never had a chance, forget the future, too, let alone you, I mean really against me, 
a survivor, a killer, brooding tactician, churning, churning might, how instinct by such thew and tendon lengths, claws and razored teeth and set fast to in these tremendous bone powdering jaws meets out retribution, how justice thinks, how vengeance itself moves and eats, forever possessed by an insoluble taste for pain and extinction and always grief. And so even as something is far more mistaken than any ghost, darker than one too, instructs your wobbling legs to follow on feet, to carry out your poor decision, to paw with your hands as if the air were a ladder, low rungs to spirit you away, tiger snaps this way, tiger splinters that way, tiger cracks any other way, tiger shatters. Other than this way, tiger crushes. I go ahead and break the spines and cave in the skulls of your two sons. One still breathes, neither will survive. Your wife, Swat, goes next. Hell, she cries. Tiger clamps, still clutching your baby, her baby daughter. Tiger stabs, and then Tiger thrusts her sound. The tiger snaps, at least the end of her sound. Tiger shakes, slows your run, even wheels you back around. No more pawing for ladders no sky or storm could ever support. Did you really think I'd spare your last child? Deer number four, still alive, struggling in a slick of spreading blood over the belly of your wife's corpse, wasabi peas sticking to her naked feet. And true, for a moment this child's intelligence provokes a pause. For one thing, I don't like wasabi peas. They make me sneeze. For another thing, this child recognizes me. And in a manner not even your wife demonstrated, forget you. But if not you, and not your wife, then from where did she get such refined instincts? Unless maybe the child's not yours. Did you ever consider that? I would suggest you look into it, but well, whatever the case, and we'll never know, the child's pupils dilate wide into unholy skies, black beyond skies, forsaking stars and light, certainly forsaking vision, your kind of vision, in the name of understanding. It's quite impressive. Somehow this tiny, tiny little thing, slippery and crumbed with green and now perfectly silent and still, except maybe for the slightest ticks in her gaze as she dares meet my gaze, gathers up in the subtlest expressions one summation of my reach beyond length, my measure beyond weight, my speed beyond burden. And for one even smaller instant, shy maybe of even time itself, but still her instant, still her time, her pain becomes my pain. I nearly forget her. I nearly pass over her. I nearly leave her to a future blessed in its absence of you. Tiger's last blink. But your pain over her pain over my pain surpasses every pain. And so I choose pain. Now what? Your family smeared on my paws, streaking these whiskers, my snout wet with the labor of your love. Years and years of love, I imagine, if I wanted to imagine. I can't, I won't. I'm not actually clear it is love. Am I ever clear? After all, is a man even capable of love who throws stones at a fiction he believes will never wake from absence into agency? and then wails for mercy, or at least for a reprieve, when absence and agency wake into this? What does it matter, imagination, belief, even faith? And love? What do I know of love, you ask? Well, I love this. Too bad you didn't bring any friends. None of which I have to think, though. You can bet I feel it all, all of it, by wide surges of heat and beat long and deep throughout these limbs. By such thick muscled walls, this heart big as four-fifths, a bore your whole family, and still nowhere close to this head 
always such a density of conjugations going on in there, vast as those black forest walls and jungled coasts I hail from, from sea foam to screes and shale peaks, my place, my reason, Numerous and nuanced as seasons of fallen needles and growing needles or grains of salt-paired sand, seeds of ants, the fly-dense mirage of summer. Even if such thoughts, while I most certainly have them, I have no capacity to see, to cast their shadows ahead of me and so reveal me to me and so change me and so become something other than this me without a me, this I without an I forever denied the becoming of something more, denied the becoming of something possible, denied the becoming of someone. I think, therefore, I am, and so I can be. I cannot rethink, therefore, I am not. And so I never was, and I never will be. Darkness bonds my thoughts to darkness and casts no light. Though there is still light, just not within, only beyond, shadowless, beautiful, and so very, very bright. You. Too bad you won't survive. Too bad no one will survive. Not even me. Which in the end, I cannot think or know or even lack. I can only voice, and now, at last, you hear my voice. You feared it your whole life, rival to any rage or waking lie, and only answer to this, our breaking sky, my jaws snapping wide, fast dropping your knees, making of the largest rock the smallest word, and of the greatest word an empty cage. Thank you. <laughs>